Mr. M. K. Raghavan MP, Mr. Najib Kantapuram MLA, Chairman of the Academy, Dr. P. Unnin, Academic uh, Director of the Academy, Mr. Sankit K., Academic Director, and all other dignitaries on and off the dais, I welcome you all. I'm profusely elated to introduce our chief guest of the day. Perhaps this is a conversation on civil service. And who better to discuss civil service than Dr. Shashi Tharo, an author, politician, and former international civil servant. He straddles several words of experience. Currently, a Lok Sabha MP representing Tiruvannathapuram constituency and chairman of the Parliamentary Standing Committee on Chemical and, chemical, chemical and Fertilizers. He has previously served as Minister of State for Human Resource Development and Minister of, Minister of State for External Affairs in the Government of India. During his nearly three decade long prior career at the United Nations, he served as a peacekeeper, refugee worker, and administrator at the highest levels, serving as Under Secretary General during Kofi Annan's leadership of the organization. Dr. Tharu is also an author of award winning works of both fiction as well as non fiction. With great honor, I welcome Dr. Shashi Theru on behalf of each and each one of us. Welcome, sir. Good morning, all. Namada Civil Service Academy, Samadhi Chartulam. Itum Sandoshagaramaya, Uridiva Samanid. A Sandoshatin, Itum Valia Savisheshada. Shashi Tharoor, Kevalam, Namada Institute like Gistella. Urubakshe, in the Terenjapan Arakana Samayata, Adyamai, Kriya in the Varayana, or activity a Kurichan Namalach in the Chapol. Valer Vetistama, or Alavogene Ayrno, Namalana Narathea, Karanam, Ur Terenjapu Katatil, Elaverum, Baudika Vigasana Kurich, Samsari Gimbal. Namalu social development in a curriculum, Samsarika and Tudangia, Savisheshamaya with Terenja Pukata Idnod. A Terenja Pukatatil Uru Samuhate Martanamangil, A Samuhatil Narakenda, Adjeta Chalanam in the Varana, the educational empowerment Idikanam in the Tiricharivai Idnu, A Terenja Pukatatil Bolum, Atharabarashem, Munno Tuakan, Tayarai in a Pinilunda Idnu. And the A program. MEA Engineering College, Dandairam Vidyarthikal Sakshinirti, our project E. Pirindal Manaki, Summer Pitcha Victitamana, Dr. Shashi Tarur, and Adana, Namade to Malia Prate. Terenjerpe, Jay Chapol, Sopa Vigamayim, Adakarinula Provertangal Kellam, Namuda Kude, Uri Jesta Sahoder Nepole, Enik Tangum Tanalumai, Eden the Vision City in the Lundaya. Namada Priya Pataneda Vane, Doctor Shashi Tarur, another Sando Shaulagarion. In the Logam Pudia Matangalagar Hik in the Kalawan. Now Kalavar Kumari in the Bole, Rajatinde Rashtriya Margayana, Samuha Margayana, Vidyartical Day, Sanitia Margayana, Kerala Tinde Tumalia Savisha in the Varana, Kauma Rekarum, Cherupa Karumaya, Padinalinum, Midibati Anginum, Idail Praya Mulla Kutigal Day. Population le demography na mala perishodi chal etum savisheshe maaya kariyam Kerala te liribatti na ali shadamanam patan badinam miribatti na ali nam vaisil idayil praya mulla kutegala. Indo varanjal Kerala te inde na ali lonnu tirumani kena the Kerala menda agana menda tirumani kena na ali lonnu cheruppa man enna the attya borva maaya oru sangathiya. Adu gunda swabhavi ka maaya ma cheruppatte prajodi pikyan. Namada Nard in a design jay in the deal, Namada Nard in a Kundabogunadil, Namada Nard in a Naikunadil, our youthfulness undakan, Tirchiaim, Vivega Shaligala, Rastri and Edakale, Rajum, Kalevu Mavisha Padano Katatil, Sri Shashi the Rurinde, E. Sandar Shenatin, Valia Pratha and Yamunda in the Anmanaslak. Other one to Tirchiaim, Nangal Valar Sando Shatoda, they had the Swagatam Jayna Doda Pum, Matur Gairin Gudin Kaparan and other Nangali Pirindel Manil in the Urukuchu Vimanam take off Chegaya. E. Rajatinde, Civil Service Saga Shatilek, E. Kutigal, Turchiaim, Uralpudagaramaya, Sanidiamai, Thirum in 
എൻ്റെ ഉറച്ച വിശ്വാസമാണ് ഇവിടെ നിൽക്കുമ്പോൾ എന്നെ നയിക്കുന്നു ഒരു പത്ത് വർഷം കഴിഞ്ഞാൽ ഇന്ത്യയിൽ ഏറ്റവും കൂടുതൽ സിവിൽ സർവീസുകാർ എവിടെ നിന്ന് വരുന്നു എന്ന് ചോദിക്കുമ്പോൾ നമുക്ക് തീർച്ചയായും പറയാൻ കഴിയും അത് പെരിന്തൽമണ്ണയിൽ നിന്ന് തന്നെയായിരിക്കും മലബാറിൽ നിന്ന് തന്നെ ആ കോൺഫിഡൻസിലാണ് ഞങ്ങൾ വർക്ക് ചെയ്യുന്നത് ഈ രാജ്യത്തെ സേവിക്കാൻ നേരത്തെ ഉണ്ണിൻ സാഹിബ് ഇവിടെ സംസാരിച്ചപ്പോൾ പറഞ്ഞ പോലെ വളരെ സെക്കുലറായ എല്ലാ ജനവിഭാഗങ്ങളെയും ഉൾക്കൊള്ളാൻ കഴിയുന്ന പാർശ്വവൽക്കരിക്കപ്പെട്ടവരുടെ സങ്കടങ്ങളും ദുഃഖങ്ങളും ഏറ്റുവാങ്ങാൻ കഴിയുന്ന ഒരു ജനസേവകരുടെ സംഘമാണ് നമ്മൾ ആഗ്രഹിക്കുന്നത് ആ ജനസേവകരുടെ സംഘത്തെ പ്രതിനിധാനം ചെയ്യുന്ന വാല്യൂസ് ഉള്ള മൊറാലിറ്റി ഉള്ള ഈ രാഷ്ട്രത്തോട് കൂറും സേവന സന്നദ്ധതയുമുള്ള പാവങ്ങളുടെയും പ്രയാസമനുഭവിക്കുന്നവരുടെയും കണ്ണീരപ്പാൻ കഴിയുന്ന സിവിൽ സർവീസ് സിവിൽ സെർവൻസിനെയാണ് ഈ അക്കാദമി പ്രതിനിധാനം ചെയ്യാൻ ആഗ്രഹിക്കുന്നത് നാളെ ഈ കുട്ടികൾ ആ ചരിത്രം എഴുതുമ്പോൾ ഞങ്ങളുടെ ആ യാത്രയ്ക്കൊപ്പം തീർച്ചയായും ഡോക്ടർ ശശി തരൂർ കൂടി ഉണ്ട് എന്നത് ഞങ്ങളുടെ കരുത്തും ശക്തിയുമാണ് എന്നുകൂടി ഓർമ്മിപ്പിച്ചുകൊണ്ട് ഈ നല്ല പരിപാടിയിൽ തീർച്ചയായിട്ടും ഒട്ടേറെ പേർ പരാമർശിക്കപ്പെടേണ്ടതുണ്ട് ഞാൻ പറയുന്നില്ല ഈ സ്ഥാപനം ഒരുപാട് ആളുകളുടെ കഠിനാധ്വാനം സമർപ്പണം നമുക്കറിയാം ഒരു സ്ഥാപനം എന്ന് പറയുന്നത് ഒരുപാട് പേരുടെ ജീവിതമാണ് സമർപ്പണമാണ് ത്യാഗമാണ് ആ ത്യാഗത്തിന് നേതൃത്വം നൽകിയവരാണ് ആ പിറകിൽ ഇരിക്കുന്നവരിൽ പലരും ഇന്ന് ഇവിടെ എത്തിച്ചേരേണ്ടിയിരുന്ന വളരെ പ്രധാനപ്പെട്ട ഒരു ഗസ്റ്റുണ്ട് നമ്മുടെ കെ പ്രിയങ്കരനായ ഫൈസൽ ഖാൻ ഫൈസൽ അൻഷബാന ഫൗണ്ടേഷൻ്റെ കോ ഫൗണ്ടർ കൂടിയായിട്ടുള്ള ഫൈസൽ ഖ കൂടി ഈ ഒരു ചടങ്ങിന് എത്തുമെന്ന് അറിയിച്ചിരുന്നു അത് പക്ഷേ അദ്ദേഹത്തിന് എത്താൻ കഴിഞ്ഞില്ല അദ്ദേഹം ഉൾപ്പെടെ ഇതിനു വേണ്ടി ത്യാഗപൂർണമായ പ്രവർത്തനം നടത്തിയ ഒട്ടേറെ പേർ ഈ കൂട്ടത്തിലുണ്ട് ഡോക്ടർ ഉണ്ണീൻ സാഹിബ് അടക്കം എല്ലാവരുമുണ്ട് രാഘവട്ടൻ എന്ന് പറഞ്ഞാൽ എൻ്റെ വീട്ടിലെ ഒരംഗമാണ് എന്നും ഞാൻ കോഴിക്കോട്ട് അദ്ദേഹത്തിൻ്റെ തെരഞ്ഞെടുപ്പ് കാലം മുതൽ ഉണ്ടായ ഒരാത്മബന്ധം എന്നും നമ്മുടെ ഡോക്ടർ ശശി തരൂരിൻ്റെ വ്യത്യസ്തമായ പരിപാടികളെക്കുറിച്ച് ആലോചിച്ചപ്പോൾ ഈ അക്കാദമിയിലേക്ക് ഡോക്ടർ ശശി തരൂരിനെ കൊണ്ടുവരാൻ ഏറ്റവും കൂടുതൽ സഹായിച്ച പ്രിയപ്പെട്ട നമ്മുടെ എല്ലാം അഭിമാനമായ എം പി മലബാറിൻ്റെ വികസനത്തിന് വേണ്ടി വളരെ പ്രധാനമായി പ്രത്യേകിച്ചും കാലിക്കറ്റ് എയർപോർട്ടിൻ്റെ വികസനത്തിന് വേണ്ടി ഒട്ടേറെ നാടികക്കല്ലുകൾ നാട്ടിയിട്ടുള്ള പ്രിയപ്പെട്ട ശ്രീ എം കെ രാഘവൻ എം പിയെ കൂടി നമുക്ക് ഈ ചടങ്ങിൽ ലഭിച്ചു എന്നത് സന്തോഷമുള്ള കാര്യമാണ് ഞാൻ ദീർഘിപ്പിക്കുന്നില്ല ഞാൻ എടുക്കുന്ന ഓരോ നിമിഷവും ശശി തരൂരിൻ്റെ സമയത്തിൽ നിന്നുള്ളതാണ് എന്നതുകൊണ്ട് ഞാൻ ഐ റെസ്പെക്ട് ഐ വാല്യൂ യുവർ ടൈം അതുകൊണ്ട് ഞങ്ങളുടെ സംസാരം കൂടുതൽ ദീർഘമാകേണ്ടതില്ല എന്ന തീരുമാനത്തോടെ ഞാൻ അവസാനിപ്പിക്കുന്നു ഈ ചടങ്ങിൽ സംസാരിക്കുന്നതിന് മുമ്പ് രണ്ട് മിനിറ്റ് മാത്രം ഇതിൻ്റെ ഒരു മിഷനെക്കുറിച്ച് പറയാൻ ഞങ്ങളുടെ ഡയറക്ടർ കൂടിയായിട്ടുള്ള സംഗീതന ക്ഷണിക്കും Good morning, one and all. De respected Dr. Thadur. If you want to talk about this India, you will be able to talk about this India. That's why I'm happy to talk about this India. So, this project is about the first time of the project. The project is about the Civil Service Academy. The first time of the project is about the first time of the project. The first time of the project is about the first time of the project. The first time of the project. അതിന് പുറത്ത് ആ സ്റ്റീരിയോ ടൈപ്പുകളെ മറികടന്നുകൊണ്ട് മലബാറിൽ ഇത്തരം ഒരു സ്ഥാപനം എന്തിന് ആരംഭിച്ചു എന്നുള്ളതും അത്തരം ഒരു സ്ഥാപനം പൂർണ്ണമായും സൗജന്യമായി കുട്ടികളെ പഠിപ്പിക്കുന്ന രൂപത്തിൽ എന്തിന് എൻവിഷൻ ചെയ്തു എന്നുള്ളതുമാണ് ഈ പ്രോജക്റ്റിനെ സംബന്ധിച്ച് വിശദീകരിക്കേണ്ട കാര്യങ്ങളെന്ന് എനിക്ക് തോന്നുന്നു അതിൽ ഏറ്റവും ആദ്യത്തെ കാര്യം സദേൺ കേരളത്തെ സംബന്ധിച്ചും തീർച്ചയായിട്ടും അവിടെ നിലവാരമുള്ള സിവിൽ സർവീസ് പരിശീലന കേന്ദ്രങ്ങളുണ്ട് അവിടെ നിന്ന് നിരന്തരമായ റിസൾട്ടുകൾ ഉണ്ടാവുന്നുണ്ട് സ്വകാര്യ മേഖലയിലാണെങ്കിലും ധാരാളം സിവിൽ സർവീസ് പരിശീലന കേന്ദ്രങ്ങൾ നടക്കുന്ന സ്ഥലമാണ് കേരളം അത് തിരുവനന്തപുരത്ത് ബേസ് ചെയ്തിട്ടാണ് നടക്കുന്നത് ഈ കാര്യം തീർച്ചയായിട്ടും നോർത്തേൺ കേരളത്തെ സംബന്ധിച്ച് മലബാറിനെ സംബന്ധിച്ച് മലബാറിൻ്റെ സിവിൽ സർവീസ് പ്രാതിനിധ്യത്തെ മാത്രമല്ല മലബാറിൽ സിവിൽ സർവീസിന് തയ്യാറെടുക്കുന്ന ആളുകൾ ഉണ്ടാവുക അത്തരത്തിലൊരു സിവിൽ സർവീസ് എക്കോ സിസ്റ്റം ഡെവലപ്പ് ചെയ്യുന്നതിനെ പോലും പലപ്പോഴും തടസ്സമായി നിന്നിട്ടുണ്ട് അതുകൊണ്ടാണ് ഇത്തരത്തിലൊരു വെഞ്ചർ അത് പെരിന്തൽമണ്ണ പോലെ മലബാറിൽ ആക്സസബിൾ ആയ ഒരു സ്ഥലത്ത് തുടങ്ങണമെന്ന് ഒരു വിഷൻ ഞങ്ങൾ നോക്കിക്കാണുകയും അത് നടപ്പാക്കാനുള്ള ശ്രമങ്ങൾ നടത്തുകയും ചെയ്തത് അതിൻ്റെ
ഒരു വലിയ തോതിൽ ഇന്ത്യയിലെ ഏറ്റവും മികച്ച അധ്യാപകർ പഠിപ്പിക്കുന്ന ഒരു സ്ഥാപനമായി ഇതിനെ മാറ്റി തീർത്തത് അതിന് അവരോട് എല്ലാവരോടും ഞങ്ങൾ കടപ്പെട്ടവരാണ് ഞങ്ങൾ തീർച്ചയായിട്ടും ഈ സ്ഥാപനം കുട്ടികൾക്ക് സൗജന്യമായി നമ്മൾ സിവിൽ സർവീസ് പഠിപ്പിക്കുക എന്ന ഒരു ചാരിറ്റബിൾ വെഞ്ചർ ആയിട്ടല്ല ഇത് ചെയ്യുന്നത് മറിച്ച് ഇവിടെ തിരഞ്ഞെടുക്കപ്പെട്ടിട്ടുള്ള നൂറ് കുട്ടികളും ഈ രാജ്യത്തെ ഈ നാട്ടിലെ ഏറ്റവും മികച്ച തലച്ചോറുകളാണ് ഈ നാട്ടിലെ ഏറ്റവും എഡ്യൂക്കേറ്റഡ് ആയ കുട്ടികളാണ് നിങ്ങളുടെ കഴിവിന്മേൽ നിങ്ങളുടെ വിദ്യാഭ്യാസ യോഗ്യതയിന്മേൽ നിങ്ങളുടെ ടാലൻറ്റിന്മേൽ ഞങ്ങളൊരു ഇൻവെസ്റ്റ്മെൻറ്റ് നടത്തുകയാണ് നാളെ ഈ നാട്ടിലെ നൂറ് ഏറ്റവും മികച്ച ഉത്തരങ്ങളായിരിക്കും ഒന്ന് പോലും മിസ് ചെയ്യാതെ നിങ്ങൾ അത് ശ്രദ്ധിക്കുക നിങ്ങളുടെ സമയത്ത് നിന്ന് അര മിനിറ്റ് പോലും അപഹരിക്കാൻ ഉദ്ദേശിക്കുന്നില്ല നന്ദി നമ്മുടെ ഈ ചടങ്ങിൽ ബഹുമാന്യനായ ഡോക്ടർ ശശി തൊരുന്ന് നമ്മുടെ അക്കാഡമിയുടെ ഉപഹാരം സമർപ്പിക്കുന്നതിന് വേണ്ടി നമ്മുടെ ഈ സ്ഥാപനത്തിൻ്റെ എല്ലാം എല്ലാമായിട്ടുള്ള ഡോക്ടർ ഉണ്ണീൻ സാഹിബിനെ ക്ഷണിക്കുന്നു നമ്മുടെ എല്ലാ ഗസ്റ്റുകളും അടക്കം നമ്മൾ പുറകിലോട്ട് ഇരിക്കുകയാണ് നമ്മുടെ ഈ ചടങ്ങ് ഡോക്ടർ ശശി തരൂരിന് അദ്ദേഹത്തിൻ്റെ വേദി കൈമാറിയ രാഘവട്ടം രാഘവട്ടം സംസാരിക്കുന്നില്ല എന്ന് പറഞ്ഞതായിരുന്നു എന്നാൽ ഒരു വാക്ക് പറയാതെ പോകുന്ന ഒരു ശരിയല്ലല്ലോ ഓക്കെ എൻ്റെ മൂന്ന് തെരഞ്ഞെടുപ്പുകളിലും ലോകസഭ തെരഞ്ഞെടുപ്പുകളിൽ എൻ്റെ റൈറ്റും ലെഫ്റ്റുമായി പ്രവർത്തിച്ച ഒരാളാണ് ശ്രീ നജീബ് അന്ന് എനിക്കറിയാമായിരുന്നു നജീബ് എവിടെങ്കിലും എത്തുമെന്ന് അങ്ങനെയാണ് പെരും നേതൃമണ്ണിൽ എത്തിയിട്ടുള്ളത് ഇനിവിടെ നിന്ന് അത്ര എളുപ്പമൊന്നല്ല നജീബിനെ ഒഴിവാക്കാൻ ആർക്കും കഴിയില്ല എന്നാണ് എൻ്റെ വിശ്വാസം നജീബ് ഒരു സ്ഥലത്ത് എത്തിക്കഴിഞ്ഞാൽ ഈ കാന്തം ഇരുമ്പ് കുടികൾ ആകർഷിക്കും പോലെയാണ് എല്ലാവരെയും വിശ്വാസമെടുക്കാൻ ഒരു ഇൻക്ലൂസീവായിട്ടുള്ള മനസ്സുള്ള ഒരു 
വലിയ മനുഷ്യനാണ് അദ്ദേഹം അദ്ദേഹം പ്രാ പ്രായം കൊണ്ടും വലിപ്പം കൊണ്ടും അദ്ദേഹം ചെറിയ രൂപമാണെങ്കിലും മനസ്സിൻ്റെ വലിപ്പം വളരെ വലുതാണ് അതുകൊണ്ട് തീർച്ചയായും അതിൻ്റെ ഫലമായിട്ടാണ് ഈ ഒരു ഇൻസ്റ്റിറ്റ്യൂട്ട് ഉണ്ടായിട്ടുള്ളത് ഒരു മിഷണറിയാണ് അദ്ദേഹം തർക്കം നിങ്ങൾക്ക് വേണ്ട അതുകൊണ്ട് ഈ ഒരു സ്ഥാപനം ചരിത്രത്തിൻ്റെ ഭാഗമാകുന്നു അതിൽ ഉപരി എനിക്ക് തോന്നുന്നത് ശ്രീ നജീബിൻ്റെ ജീവിതത്തിൽ ഏറ്റവും കൂടുതൽ സംതൃപ്തി ഉണ്ടാകുന്ന ഉണ്ടാക്കുന്ന ഒന്നായി ഇത് മാറും എന്നാണ് എൻ്റെ വിശ്വാസം എല്ലാ ആശംസകൾ നേരുന്നു നന്ദി നമസ്കാരം ഇനി നമ്മളെല്ലാം പ്രതീക്ഷിക്കുന്നത് ഡോക്ടർ ശശി തരൂരിൻ്റെ വാക്കുകളാണ് അദ്ദേഹത്തിന് വേണ്ടി വേദി ഒഴിവാകുന്നു നമ്മൾ പ്രോഗ്രാം എല്ലാവരും നമ്മൾ പിറകിലേക്ക് ഇരിക്കുകയാണ് ഓക്കെ ശശി തരൂർ മാത്രമാണ് ഈ വേദിയിലുണ്ടാവുക താങ്ക് യു നജി കുട്ടികളെ ഞാൻ ദീർഘമായി സംസാരിക്കുന്നില്ല ഞങ്ങൾക്കൊരു തിരക്കുള്ളൊരു പ്രോഗ്രാമാണ് അപ്പം നിങ്ങളുടെ ചോദ്യങ്ങൾക്ക് മറുപടി പറയാനാണ് ഞാൻ എത്തിയിരിക്കുന്നത് പക്ഷെ രണ്ട് വാക്ക് നമ്മൾ നജീവിനെ കുറിച്ച് പറഞ്ഞിട്ടില്ലെങ്കിൽ ശരിയല്ല കാരണം ഞാൻ ഇവരെല്ലാവരും ഒന്ന് സൂചിപ്പിച്ച പോലെ ഞാൻ അദ്ദേഹത്തിനൊപ്പം ഇവിടെ തെരഞ്ഞെടുപ്പ് പ്രചരണം ചെയ്യാൻ വന്നപ്പോഴാണ് അദ്ദേഹത്തിൻ്റെ ക്രിയ ഐഡിയയെ കുറിച്ച് കണ്ടുപിടിച്ചത് അത് കഴിഞ്ഞിട്ട് ഈ അടുത്ത രണ്ട് വർഷത്തിൽ രണ്ട് രണ്ടര വർഷത്തിൽ കേരള നിയമസഭയുടെ വേറെ ഏതൊരു എം എൽ എൻ്റെ ഒപ്പം ഇത്ര ചടങ്ങിൽ പങ്കെടുക്കാൻ എനിക്ക് അവസരം ഉണ്ടായിട്ടില്ല പക്ഷേ ഈ നജീബിൻ്റെ ഒപ്പമാണ് എല്ലാം വെച്ച് കൂടുതൽ കാരണം അദ്ദേഹത്തിന് അത്രത്തോളം ഐഡിയാസ് അത്രത്തോളം ഇനിഷ്യേറ്റീവ് എടുത്ത കാരണം അദ്ദേഹത്തിൻ്റെ ക്രിയ ആക്ടിവിറ്റീസ് അദ്ദേഹത്തിൻ്റെ ഈ ഹൈദരലി ഷിഹാബ് തങ്ങൾ അക്കാഡമി ഫോർ സിവിൽ സർവീസസ് അദ്ദേഹത്തിൻ്റെ ഓരോരു സാമൂഹ്യ പ്രവർത്തനങ്ങൾ ഇതെല്ലാം എനിക്ക് നല്ലോണം ഇഷ്ടപ്പെട്ടിട്ടുണ്ട് അപ്പം ശ്രീ രാഘവൻ പറഞ്ഞ പോലെ ഞങ്ങൾക്ക് ഈ എം എൽ എൻ്റെ ഒപ്പം ഒരു അടുത്തൊരു ബന്ധമായിട്ടാണ് ഞാൻ ഇന്ന് നിങ്ങളൊപ്പം നേരെ വീണ്ടും എത്തിയിരിക്കുന്നത് നിങ്ങളിപ്പോൾ സിവിൽ സർവീസിൽ നിന്ന് പഠിക്കുന്നു നമ്മളുടെ രാജ്യത്തിൻ്റെ ചരിത്രത്തിൽ പത്ത് ഇരുപത് വർഷമായിട്ട് വലിയ ഒരു മാറ്റമാണ് വന്നിരിക്കുന്നത് ദ ഡെമോക്രറ്റൈസേഷൻ ഓഫ് ആ സിവിൽ സർവീസസ് ആരംഭിക്കുമ്പോൾ ഐ സി എസ് കാലം മുതൽക്ക് ആദ്യത്തെ ഐ എ എസ് ഐ എഫ് എസ് ഒക്കെ എലീറ്റ് സർവീസസ് ആയിട്ട് അറിഞ്ഞപ്പെടുന്നു അതിൻ്റെ അർത്ഥം ഒരു ആകെ ഇന്ത്യയിൽ ഒരു പത്ത് ഇരുപത് കോളേജുകളോ യൂണിവേഴ്സിറ്റീസ് എന്നോ പഠിച്ച് വരുന്ന കുട്ടികൾക്ക് മാത്രമായിരുന്നു ഈ സിവിൽ സർവീസസിലെ അഡ്മിഷൻ കിട്ടാനുള്ള സാധ്യത അപ്പോൾ സാധാരണക്കാർക്ക് ഒരു ബാരിയർ ഉണ്ടെന്ന് മനസ്സിലാക്കിയപ്പോൾ നമ്മളുടെ സർക്കാർ അതിന് തുറന്നു കുറച്ചും കൂടി ജനങ്ങൾക്ക് ഓരോരോ ഭാഷയിൽ എഴുതാൻ പരീക്ഷ എഴുതാൻ ഓരോരോ സബ്ജെക്ട്സിൻ്റെ എണ്ണം കൂട്ടാനൊക്കെ സമ്മതിച്ച ശേഷം നമുക്ക് നല്ല ഒരു സോഷ്യൽ റെപ്രസെൻറ്റേഷൻ വരാൻ തുടങ്ങിയിട്ടുണ്ട് എല്ലാ വിഭാഗം എല്ലാ മാർഗത്തിൻ്റെ വ്യക്തികൾക്ക് ഐ എ എസിലും സെൻട്രൽ സർവീസസിലും ഒക്കെ പങ്കെടുക്കാനുള്ള സാധ്യത കൂടിയിട്ടുണ്ട് അപ്പോൾ ഇപ്പോൾ നമ്മളുടെ വിദ്യാർത്ഥികൾക്ക് ഇത് വലിയൊരു ആസ്പിറേഷൻ ആയിട്ടും ഒരു ലെജിറ്റിമേറ്റ് പോസിബിലിറ്റി ആയിട്ട് മാറി വന്നൊരു ഓപ്ഷനാണ് സിവിൽ സർവീസസ് പക്ഷേ നജി പറഞ്ഞ പോലെ അല്ല സംഗീത്ത് പറഞ്ഞ പോലെ നിങ്ങളുടെ അക്കാഡമിക് ഡയറക്ടർ പറഞ്ഞ പോലെ കൂടുതൽ ആൾക്കാരെ ഒരു സംസ്ഥാനത്തിൻ്റെ തലസ്ഥാനത്തിലാണ് ഇതിൻ്റെ പ്രിപ്പറേഷൻ ചെയ്യലും പരീക്ഷ എഴുതലും അവർക്ക് അവിടുന്ന് ജയിക്കാനുള്ള പ്രതീക്ഷ ഉള്ളത് അപ്പോൾ നജീബിൻ്റെ ഈ കാഴ്ചപ്പാട് പെരുന്തൽ മണ്ണ പോലെ ഒരു സ്ഥലത്തിൽ നമ്മളൊരു അക്കാദമി ഓഫ് സിവിൽ സർവീസ് കൊണ്ടുവന്നാൽ നമുക്ക് അതിനെങ്കാട്ടും ഒരു ബ്രോഡ് ബേസ്ഡ് എൻട്രി സിവിൽ സർവീസിലേക്ക് ചെയ്യാൻ സാധിക്കുന്നത് പറയണത് അതൊരു ഫസ്റ്റ് ക്ലാസ് ഇനിഷ്യേറ്റീവ് ആണ് എനിക്കൊരു സംശയമില്ല ഇവിടെ ഇരിക്കുന്ന പല കുട്ടികൾ പരീക്ഷയിൽ സക്സസ്ഫുൾ ആവും നിങ്ങൾ നമ്മുടെ രാജ്യത്തിൻ്റെ സേവനത്തിൽ ഇറങ്ങും അതുകൊണ്ട് ഇത് കൊണ്ടുവന്നതിന് എനിക്ക് നല്ലൊരു അഭിപ്രായമാണ് ആൻഡ് ഐ എം വെരി ഹാപ്പി ടു ബി ഹെറ്റ് സപ്പോർട്ട് ഇറ്റ് ഞാൻ കൂടുതൽ സംസാരിക്കാൻ പോകുന്നില്ലെന്ന് പറഞ്ഞില്ലേ അപ്പോൾ അതോടെ ഞാൻ നിർത്തുന്നു നിങ്ങളുടെ മനസ്സിലുള്ള ചോദ്യങ്ങൾ എനിക്ക് മറുപടി പറയാൻ സാധിക്കുന്ന ചോദ്യങ്ങളിൽ ഞാൻ മറുപടി പറയാം എന്തായാലും നിങ്ങളുടെ മനസ്സിൽ എന്താ ഉള്ളത് നിങ്ങളുടെ ചിന്തകൾ എന്താണെന്നാണ് എനിക്ക് അറിയാൻ ആവശ്യം ഞാൻ എപ്പോഴും പറഞ്ഞു ഇന്ന് രാവിലെയും കൂടി രജീവിനോട് പറഞ്ഞു അല്ല ഞാൻ സാധിക്കലി ഷിഹാബ് തങ്ങളുടെ കണ്ടപ്പോൾ പറഞ്ഞ
നിങ്ങളുടെ മനസ്സിലുള്ള ചോദ്യങ്ങൾ മാത്രമല്ല നിങ്ങളുടെ മനസ്സിലുള്ള അഭിപ്രായങ്ങളും എൻ്റെ ഒപ്പം പങ്കെടുത്താൽ എനിക്ക് നല്ലോണം ഇഷ്ടപ്പെടും അത് മാത്രം പറഞ്ഞിട്ട് വൺസ് അഗൻ കൺഗ്രാച്ചുലേഷൻസ് ഓൺ യുവർ അഡ്മിഷൻ ഹിയർ ഗുഡ് ലക്ക് ഇൻ യുവർ സ്റ്റഡീസ് ആൻഡ് ഓൾ സക്സസ് ഫോർ ദ ഫ്യൂച്ചർ ജയ ഹിന്ദ് ഇരുന്നിട്ട് നിങ്ങളുടെ ചോദ്യങ്ങൾ ഉത്തരം പറയാം പറയാം ഹാൻഡ് ഹെൽ മൈക്ക് ഉണ്ടല്ലോ ആ പറയാം സാർ ഐ വുഡ് ലൈക് ടു ആസ്ക് ക്വസ്റ്റ്യൻ റിഗാർഡിങ് വാട്ട് ആർ ദ ഗ്ലോബൽ ഇംപ്ലിക്കേഷൻസ് ആൻഡ് ഓപ്പർച്യൂണിറ്റീസ് ദാറ്റ് ഇന്ത്യ ഹാഡ് ഇൻ ടു തൗസൻഡ് ട്വൻറ്റി ത്രീ റിഗാർഡിങ് ടേക്കിംഗ് അപ്പ് ദ പ്രസിഡൻസി ഓഫ് ജി ജി സമ്മിറ്റ് ആസ് വെൽ ആസ് എസ് സി ഒ ആൻഡ് ആസ് വെൽ ഇൻ ദ നെക്സ്റ്റ് മന്ത് ഇന്ത്യ ഇസ് ഗോയിങ് ടു ബി ഹെൽത്ത് ദ യു എൻ എസ് സി പ്രസിഡൻസി റിഗാർഡിങ് യുവർ ഒപ്പീനിയൻ വെൽ നെക്സ്റ്റ് മന്ത് ഇസ് ഓൾസോ ആർ ലാസ്റ്റ് മന്ത് ഓൺ ദ സെക്യൂരിറ്റി കൗൺസിൽ സോ വിൽ ഹോൾഡ് ദ പ്രസിഡൻസി ബട്ട് ദർ ആഫ് ടു വി ലീവ് ദ സെക്യൂരിറ്റി കൗൺസിൽ സോ ദാറ്റ്സ് നോട്ട് എ ലോങ് ടേം പൊസിഷൻ ഹവ് എവർ വി വിൽ ഇൻ ഡീഡ് ബി പ്രസിഡൻറ്റ് അബൌട്ട് ദ ജി ട്വൻറ്റി and the shanghai cooperation organization which is a very unusual combination because the g20 is a global body that looks after the macro economic issues in the world and the shanghai cooperation organization is a much smaller body of east asian countries which is normally considered to be under the strong influence if not domination of china and russia so for india to be associated with both in some ways is part of our overall strategy of being partners with everybody it's been very striking if you look at it that every year our foreign minister meets with the foreign ministers of russia and china in a grouping called ric then he adds the brazilians and the south africans to so the same and it becomes brics and then he removes the russians but keeps the chinese for basic for uh, environmental negotiations and then he removes uh, both the chinese and the russians for ipsa which is the india brazil south africa south south cooperation forum so we are in various kinds of configurations and not only because our country's name begins with that very essential element in any acronym which is a vowel but also because we have something useful to contribute to all of these bodies and they in turn have something to gain from our participation so this is not so much non alignment the old mudra vakyam it is now multi alignment and that is the term that i came up with when i was minister uh 12 years ago and at that time no one took it up but now i'm very pleased to say that the present government has found that phrase useful and it's increasingly being used uh, by the government multi alignment as uh, as a as a legitimate strategy of india you see what are the possibilities the possibilities are for certainly both enhanced global as well as regional influence uh, the question is how we use that influence particularly when it comes to economic challenges because there is a widespread belief that the world is facing a recession a recession as you all know and you must know this it's a basic concept in economics is a period in which in at least one quarter there is negative rate of growth you understand economic growth is always in positive terms so you may grow by 2% you may grow by only 0.3% whatever but you grow that's the normal way of life but when there is a recession the economy shrinks and you have negative growth now if that's expected around the world it can have a terrible effect because when there is recession the prices of land will drop the prices of property will drop salaries will drop unemployment will increase it becomes a much more difficult and unsustainable period in those circumstances for a country like india what stands we take will be of great interest first of all to the other countries particularly other developing countries and secondly will be of great importance to our own people because if we can influence the direction of the world economy in such a way that we can help our own people to grow and flourish better then that is indispensable for india so the possibilities are there but they're also uncertain and it depends on our ability and our smarts to guide the world economy in the right direction some of our existing steps which have popular support in india are very really, are seen with dismay abroad an example is make in india because make in india is a protectionist policy which raises tariffs and taxes on imported goods goods coming from other countries in favor of those goods made in india 
Now, we in India, we welcome that because Indian manufacturers benefit. But from a global point of view, it means a shrinking of the possibilities of world trade and of integration with foreign economies, with global economies. And equally, the concern is that the Indian consumer may pay more for less high quality goods than could be imported because of the tariffs on import and the protection given to domestic industry. So these are all difficult choices that have to be made. You make a choice in a democracy very often, not because it is the best option favored by economists, but because you want to win votes. And that is not necessarily a good recipe for economic growth. By and large, it's been established that trade benefits all. But it is also true that your own domestic industries often feel that they're not able to compete with foreign manufacturers, and therefore they ask for protection. And these are political choices that the government of the day has to make. The next question. Sir, first of all, I am expressing my gratitude and excitement. Can you raise the mic a little closer to you? Sir, sir first of all, I am expressing my gratitude and excitement to interact with you. Today, the technology is changing rapidly and manifesting every aspect of life. And data is the new oil of the century. Recently, little closer. The, the recently, the data protection bill was withdrawn from the parliament and uh, planning to introduce a new one. So my question is, how complex the process of framing a legal framework which regulate the cyberspace and data privacy of the citizens of the country? It's a very complex process, but the government has made it more difficult than it needs to be. There are very good data protection bills around the world. The European Union has a very highly respected standard called the GDPR. Most Western democracies have excellent data protection bills. It would not have been difficult for us to be inspired by other countries' models. Unfortunately, our government has written a very restrictive data protection bill. Uh, there is now a new draft that has come out, which on the one hand is very business friendly in that it makes things very easy for businesses to be able to function, to start in India, to thrive in India, and so on. But any protection that is afforded to the citizens of India for their personal data is overridden when it comes to the government. The government can essentially take anybody's data and use it and misuse it as they wish, as long as they claim it is on grounds of national security, sovereignty, friendly relations with foreign states, and so on. And no one can challenge the government even in a court of law. There is a data protection authority that has been created. But instead of that being an independent body, it is a body consisting entirely of government civil servants. So civil servants will be the one signing the order to sequester your data. And if you appeal saying the government has no right to take my data, civil servants will decide. So the result is the government has total control. It is an extremely regressive draft which very many people in our country are extremely alarmed about. Already a spate of articles have come out expressing grave concern about this draft, and we will have to have some serious discussions in Parliament. But the government has a brute majority, and I really worry about this bill. It gets even more serious because this bill has been delayed so much that various laws have been passed which involve the government collecting your data for example, the DNA bill. The government can take your DNA, and now under this bill, they can keep it or use it or misuse it as they wish, and they are untouchable. Now, that's not how a democracy is supposed to function. In a democracy, the citizenship, the citizens should have protection from the government also, not only from each other, not only from criminal syndicates. We need protection to ensure that the government, for political reasons or other reasons, doesn't misuse their access to citizens' data. For example, we know for a fact that there has been a great deal of tapping of telephones in our country. Many politicians' phones have been tapped. And the worry about this is, under this new data protection law, 
whereas under the old law illegal telephone tapping was justiciable you could go to the courts and actually fines were supposed to be imposed on those who did illegal tapping of your phone today they are completely protected and they are essentially they have impunity against any improper behavior it's shocking the next question good morning sir citing climate of harassment and intimidation amnesty international put an end to the operations in india and you yourself said few years back that charging amnesty with sedition is a big mistake in the indian context do you think amnesty international was more vocal in raising their voice than un where it remained a mute spectator to specific atrocities sir yeah i'm also very disappointed with that action of the government because i believe that amnesty international has unparalleled credibility around the world as a human rights body and remember that the staff of amnesty international in india were indians the head of amnesty international was a very well known journalist and columnist called akar patel there is no question that you are looking at an organization that has great credibility around the world and therefore it would have been extremely unfortunate for the government to take the action they did because it has actually downgraded the image of india as a democracy with respect for human rights it has not been a good development at all i must say and my own concern remains very strong that by doing all this india is sending a signal that it doesn't care about human rights whereas in fact the line to have taken is we welcome amnesty but we have many human rights organizations in india and we will listen to these organizations that are rooted in our soil and we will consider amnesty as one amongst them that's all we needed to say instead of this persecution and harassment and restriction on their funding and so on all of which as you said led them to leave the country we should have behaved like a democracy but unfortunately in recent years this government has not been behaving very democratically when it comes to such issues and if you look at a long list of international rankings we have slid down the rankings for press freedom we've slipped down the rankings for human rights in all of these areas india's ranking has gone further and further down and the worry i have about this is that we are doing ourselves a disservice we have created a situation where our government is undermining our credibility as a democracy most unfortunate and in fact the famous varieties of democracy institute vdem institute in stockholm sweden has actually said that india is not a democracy anymore we are an electoral autocracy that is we elect our government freely but once they are elected they behave autocratically and not democratically that is a shameful reputation to have so uh, my question is regarding the complex interdependence model so with the limited knowledge i have of ir i have pinned a question suppose 2008 we see a globalized world where economic interdependence has become the key and multipolarity has become a demand and india has been demanding multipolarity like most asian countries but yet again there is weaponized interdependence mostly by the west especially usa's recent swift sanctions against russia so what where does india's balance lie to navigate this complex cobweb model would this be used against us because neoliberalism tells us about centralized and about decentralized units of power but clearly it's asymmetrical right now so where does india lie that's a very thoughtful very very smart question thank you young lady um the world will always be asymm asymmetrical let's realize that there's no question about the fact that we live in a world where every state is supposed to be equal but when you sit around a table with various states the bigger more powerful states are bound to be more powerful and therefore displace greater weight than the smaller state that's normal human fact of life for example if you talk in the security council each country has one vote but we all know that for 14 countries their relationship with the 15th country the united states weighs heavily on their mind before they take a stand that will make the us unhappy tomorrow they may be thinking the same way about both the us and china because china is also becoming a superpower so this is the reality of the world so don't be misled into thinking 
with too much idealism, we have to be, especially if you join the civil services, you will have to have the sense to realize that we have to operate in the real world and not in the theoretical or ideal world. Having said that, yes, the, there's an old line, I'm trying to remember, it's Voltaire or somebody else who said that the strong act as they wish and the weak act as they must. And that is something which we really find more and more happening uh, in parts of international affairs. Russia, by invading Ukraine, has also shown that it is among the strong countries, that it can openly violate the UN Charter, which prohibits the use of force to settle international disputes. And nobody can do anything about it. Yes, the West has imposed sanctions, but not every country has agreed with that. There are no UN sanctions on Russia. There are unilateral sanctions by Western countries. And therefore, you're finding a situation where countries like India have actually increased their trade with Russia rather than sanctioning it. So if you are powerful enough and you have enough that the world needs, you can get away with a lot. <clears throat> and that is the truth about world affairs. I'm being very blunt with you. And the United Nations is a mirror of the world. It reflects our agreements and disagreements, our different sizes and strengths, our different weights in world affairs. We shouldn't pretend otherwise. The General Assembly may be one vote per state, but in the Security Council and the key decision-making bodies have no illusions. The more powerful will more often than not get their way. But don't forget, we are seeing violations of the Charter by many. The U.S. marched into Iraq without the approval of the Security Council. Russia marched into Ukraine without the approval of the Security Council. China marched into Tibet back in 1950 without the approval of the Security Council. So you're looking at case after case where those who feel they are powerful enough to get away with certain kinds of action will do so. And as far as India is concerned, we respect international law, but I too think that in our own neighborhood, if necessary, we may well be capable of acting without much regard for the ideal prescriptions of law if we believe that our overriding national interest demands it. I don't know if that fully answers your question, but it is part of the reality we live with. When it comes to things like sanctions on Russia, as I said, we are not playing ball with that. But you must understand that some have greater power. For example, the US, when they really are determined, they will not, for example, on the sanctions on Iran, they not only sanctioned Iran, but if countries and companies that did not sanction Iran traded with Iranian companies, those Indian companies, for example, were barred from any dollar transactions. And that means you can't do international trade because most of international trade is in dollars, which is why even our current trade with Russia is now ruby ruple, uh, ruble rupee. Right? Ruble rupee trade, because that cannot be sanctioned by the Americans. These are some of the new developments in international affairs which are worth watching, and I'm sure, judging by the very knowledgeable question you asked, that you're watching it very closely. Hi, sir. Good morning. Good morning. I'm Saliha, and my question is, French government has recently honored you with the highest civilian award, Chevalier de Lane Legend de Honor, for your speech in French. But sir, back in India, we have to give a compulsory Hindi test to get into the central universities, and the ministers in your parliament had the audacity to respond in Hindi for the question in Tamil. Sir, does this problem of language have a bureaucracy solution, or is it a central to a political question, sir? It is a political question, but it's also a constitutional one. Our country is a federal country. We have a number of states put together. And it is a basic reality that many states do not use Hindi, do not master Hindi, and do not see the need to do so. It is also true that we are currently ruled by a party for which Hindi, Hindutva, Hindustan is an ideology. And it has been a slogan of theirs for very many years. Now, in those circumstances, they will continue trying to push Hindi down our throats and we will continue trying to resist it. Not because we can't speak Hindi, but because we feel it will be unfair in our society if you create Hindi as a more equal than others language when it comes to government, administration, judiciary, and national correspondence, and so on, then you will create a situation in which 
you know, Shukla and Singh will have a language they have learned in their mother's laps. But Subramanyam and Reddy and Menon will have uh, absolutely no clue what's being said and they will have to make an extra effort to learn a language that they're not comfortable with at first hand. In other words, it'll become an uneven playing field and some people will have an advantage that other people do not. Now, is that fair in a federal country? The answer is clearly not. In a federal country, everybody in every state should have an equal opportunity to rise to the civil service, to get to the top positions, to be in be an authority, to be a judge, and so on. Just last week, there was an episode where a petitioner insisted on speaking Hindi, and the Malayali judge, Justice came, Joseph, very politely told him, sorry, the language of this court is English. I can't understand what you're saying. We will assign you a lawyer who will explain what you want in English. So these are the kind of challenges, you know, when you have um, our uh, BJP foreign ministers, not Jay Shankar, but before that, Sushma Swaraj, and earlier under Vajpayee, insisting on speaking Hindi at the United Nations, which meant India had to spend hundreds of thousands of dollars to translate that Hindi into other languages. The question that came to my mind and I asked it in Parliament is, what happens if you have a Bengali foreign minister or a Tamil foreign minister? Why do you want to set a precedent that you will only speak Hindi? After all, it's an advantage. I mean, we had 200 years of colonialism, which I'm bitterly opposed to. But one of the advantages that it left behind was the English language. Let's use it. It gives us a direct means of communication with the rest of the world. Not just with the English-speaking countries, huh? but English is the second language for most countries in the world. There was a time in the 17th, 18th, 19th century when French was the language of international diplomacy. Today, no doubt about it, it's English. I remember when the leaders of France and Germany met face to face. The Frenchman didn't know German, the German didn't know French, they talked to each other in English. That was what used to happen and that's something we should understand is very useful. So we are going to generate only leaders and ministers who can only speak Hindi. We are putting ourselves in a disadvantage with the rest of the world. Because when you work through a translator, it's never the same thing as when you speak directly to someone. So, my question is regarding EWS reservation system. What is your take on EWS and can India put forward it as a new unique model for poverty eradication as well as can we uh, consider it as the hope for most oppressed class in the world? So this is the philosophical issue that the Supreme Court was divided in resolving. As you know, the decision was 3-2 in the Supreme Court. The philosophical issue is is reservations a provision meant to undo millennia of social discrimination only? Or is reservation a tool to benefit the poorer sections of society? <coughs> now, when the first question of reservation came up, it was meant to be only for SCs and STs. That is, people who for 3,000 years have been oppressed in a unequal social system. Then, in 1989, came the Mandal Commission decision of the VP Singh government, 1990, and we had OBC reservations. Then, with 50% reservation in the country, the judiciary started ruling in, against the so-called creamy layer. What are the creamy layer? People saying, well, here is somebody who may be a Dalit or maybe an OBC, but their father was a secretary to the government of India or their mother was a professor. They've had all the advantages of elite education, but merely on the basis of caste, you are giving them an advantage over some poor upper caste person's ch child. So that argument was accepted by the court. The court said, okay, those who have an income above a certain level, I've forgotten the exact level that was mentioned at that time, the so-called creamy layer of these castes, they will be denied reservations. So suddenly it became an economic issue also. Because, you know, if you talk to someone who's a Dalit representative, like I've spoken to Meera Kumar on this issue, who was a former speaker of the Lok Sabha, Dr. Jagdivan Ram's daughter, her argument is that social discrimination is irrespective of status and salary and wealth. Because if you are a Dalit, in the eyes of some people, you're always a Dalit. They will not sit with you. They will not eat with you. They will not marry you, etc. And therefore, this is a means of compensating for that kind of discrimination. But the dialogue has moved in a direction which says that economic factors must also be taken into account. Otherwise, the creamy layer argument would make no sense. 
Now, the EWS judgment says that you can give the benefit of reservations to people from any caste, that's mainly to benefit the upper caste, because the others have reservations, who are economically weak. Now, the meaning of this is, I mean, I, I remember there was one of the emotional arguments that was used by somebody on social media was a photograph of a rickshaw puller, you know, wearing a sort of uh, munda or a langoti, as they would say in the north. He had a sacred thread, so he was a Brahmin. But he was thin, emaciated, you could see his ribs, a poor, poverty-stricken, wizened old man, a human pulling a rickshaw. And people said, is this a person who enjoys privilege? Or should his children have an opportunity to benefit from reservation? So that becomes the question that you have to answer. I can tell you that uh, one of the questions I was famously asked by somebody who was from an upper caste, very well-known face, I won't mention his name. He said to me, you can have a backward caste minister's son who has been to the best schools and colleges able to get into the government with let's say 60 percent marks and my poor driver is a nair his son with 80 percent is denied admission he is the son of a driver he should be the one that the government has more sympathy for than the fellow who had all the advantages and still couldn't score as many marks as the driver's son now these are the kinds of arguments where honestly you can have two different answers. And the court <coughs> came up with one answer, 3-2, and that was the answer that said, yes, economic reservations are okay. Tomorrow, somebody may come up with a different answer. Our society is reacting to the realities it sees around it. You as civil servants should be very, very aware of all of these problems. But let me say, that it's very difficult to say there is only one right answer. Because on both sides, there is justice. People say, as long as you have a country where people discriminate on the basis of caste, then caste must be the basis of granting favors. And others say, in a country where there is so much poverty, caste is not enough. Economic reality must also be taken into account. There is actually a judgment of the Supreme Court 2015 in the Jat Reservation case, which is a much more complicated judgment that says that neither caste alone, nor education alone, nor economic factors alone are enough. The government must come back to the court with a matrix of disabilities on the basis of which people are eligible for reservations. But no government has done so. And no other Supreme Court bench has returned to this idea. I wrote an article about this earlier in the Hindu. I would encourage you to Google it and read that judgment. That's a very serious complication that is there. And these are questions to which there is no finally agreed answer in our society. Hi, sir. Myself, Nizam Ibrahim. <coughs> sir, we know that our parliament is the temple of democracy. But there has been... Uh, for a democratic nation to sustain, we need qualitative deliberation. But there has been a decline in the quality and quantity of debates, discussions, and even the number of sessions in the parliament. I, I want to know about, uh, I would like to know about the, how it affects a democratic country that a parliamentary system is uh, losing its uh, legitimacy into the public. It is. I agree 100% with you. Our parliamentary system's success depends upon informed debates and discussion, which would lead, as Amartya Sen has argued, to a deliberative democracy, a democracy where issues are thrashed out between the public representatives, and then you actually end up with an informed conclusion. Instead, we have a government that prefers to reduce parliament to a rubber stamp, where its brute majority will always survive. For eight and a half years, I have never seen a single bill brought before Parliament for a vote in which the government made a single amendment that was suggested by an opposition or non-BJP MP. Not one. The only amendments they've ever voted are technical ones, like a bill may have been introduced in 2019 and passed in 2020, so you have to choose the date, so they will offer an amendment to change the date from 
so and so bill 2019 so and so bill 2020 other other but apart from that there is absolutely no other amendment they speak this is not democracy <clears throat> this is indeed as vdem institute said as i mentioned earlier electoral autocracy they have been elected so they can do what they like and they don't care what anybody else says this is a genuine problem you're also right in pointing out that the number of days of parliament have gone down that is also very dismaying because parliament is an institution which at one time under nehruji used to meet for about 250 days in the year today it is down to just over about 100 days in the year and it's really shocking but we should not forget that when mr modi was chief minister of gujarat the gujarat assembly went down from 180 days to about 56 days in a year it seems that they only want parliament to meet for the purposes of passing whatever laws they want to pass where for which they have the majority and they're not interested in any genuine discussion that's very very sad and i might add that this november when upa was in power every winter session of parliament used to be convened by mid-november around 15th of november and go on till christmas as of today we still don't have the winter session it is going to start on the 7th of december and go on till 29th obviously for all the christians all the people from the northeastern states even kerala after 25th they will not be able to attend they'll have to go home for christmas now in this kind of situation i find it incredible that the government doesn't care a three-week session good enough for them they don't worry about having very many days in parliament behind them and i would certainly share your concern that this vitiates our democracy i am angel anajoy with Hi. changing socio-political conditions caste and religion being intensified and leveraged for personal advantages is india shifting from a secular democratic country and will india become a tyranny of majority than a democracy democracy with no no way to come back as a true democracy well i there's always a way to come back which is you can vote somebody else into the government that's that's always the way to change a government's approach but uh, but you're right that there are some very worrying trends. You know, when we won independence, it was won on the basis of an understanding. <clears throat> and remember that we were not the only country to be partitioned. Around the same time, you had North and South Korea, East and West Germany, North and South Vietnam. But they were partitioned either on the basis of geography, North one side, South one side, or on the basis of ideology, communist rule on one side, and uh, pro-capitalist rule on the other. Whereas in India, it was not geography. It was not North Indians, one partition, South Indians, another. It was not ideology. It was not capitalists on one side and Marxists on the other. It was very simple on one issue that partition happened, which was the question, is religion the determinant of your nationhood? So those who said that religion is my identity and my nationalism comes from my religion, they created Pakistan. That was the idea of Pakistan. They left. And those who remained in India said, no, our freedom struggle was for everyone of every faith. And we will create a country for people of every faith. And we will not accept that religion determines nationhood. And on that basis, we created an India whose constitution, written over the next couple of years after independence, whose constitution enshrined the idea that everyone is equal, whatever your race, your religion, your caste, your color, your language, your region of birth, Nothing mattered. If you are an Indian citizen, you're equal rights. That was the fundamental difference between us and Pakistan. Pakistan, if you are not a Muslim, your passport is stamped non-Muslim. It's almost a, a, a confirmation of second-class citizenship. In India, everyone is equally use, uh, equal, and everyone of any religion can be, in theory at least, in any position in our country. Now, given that reality, what do we see? We see a situation where the one section of political opinion in India that did not agree with that, that is the Hindutva movement, who believed, like the then All India Muslim League, believed in the idea that religion should determine nationhood and that Hindus and Muslims were two separate nations. Those people actually came and what did they do? They grew from about 2-3% of the vote in the 1952 general election to a situation where today they have a majority in parliament. 
and their belief is that India is a purely Hindu country, that all others are here either as guests or have broken into our home as bandits and dacoits. That is the ideology of Hindutva, very clearly stated by the ideologues who have written these books. So they say, you know, Parsis and Jews are like guests because they come and they contribute, they're peaceful, they don't bother anybody. But Muslims and Christians came through invasion, through invaders, so they don't understand our history in South India, where, Muslim, where Islam came peacefully, Christianity came peacefully, they don't understand. They only think of Islam coming through the swords of invaders in the north and Christianity coming with the British, because they don't understand the full history of the south. But anyway, these people are the ones who are ruling today, and their narrow-mindedness is influencing all the questions that have raised the concerns in your mind. So you're quite right that we are seeing a situation where people are saying that this is a purely Hindu country, and that those who look to a foreign country for their prayer and their origins of their faith, they have, don't have the same rights in this country. And while we don't have this problem in South India, in the North, unfortunately, there have been very many examples of uh, blatant discrimination against uh, particularly Muslims, the so-called bulldozer diplomacy, the only ones whose homes are demolished. Many people in India construct homes without proper permits. The only ones whose homes are demolished by bulldozers are Muslims. You have passed the, United, uh, the um, Unlawful Activities Prevention Act, UAPA. The only ones who are thrown into jail are suspected terrorist sympathizers without bail are Muslims. The Citizenship Amendment Act, for the first time, introduces a litmus test that says any refugee from a neighboring country can get fast-track citizenship in India, provided they're not Muslim. So for the first time, you have religion coming in to determine a right of citizenship. All of this is completely shocking, and to my mind is a betrayal of our constitution, but the Supreme Court has so far not taken a stand saying that this is all unconstitutional. I'm hoping it will come to that. I know there are various legal processes going on, some in high court, some in the Supreme Court. Eventually, we need to get the government to understand, as long as they are sworn to uphold the Constitution of India, they cannot behave in a manner that is discriminatory against people of other faiths. There is no second-class citizenship in India. We are all equal, and we must fight together to ensure that our equality is preserved. I'm sorry, I've been given a warning that we have to wrap up. One last question, then I have to stop. Sir, good morning, sir. Last question. Sir, I have heard that uh, those who study history... Of You'll have to hold the mic very no. close because your mask makes it difficult to understand you. Hello, mask you told me. Sir, I have heard that uh, those who study history or those who read immensely uh, can uh, somewhat predict the future, sir. <laughs> so, uh, as we all know, you are a massive and productive reader. I would like to test your ability regarding this, sir. But what you heard is not accurate. People who study history can never predict the future. History repeats itself, sir. And we are, uh, as the title says... History very it, rarely repeats itself. It, it does sometimes echo, <laughs> but sir, it doesn't the, repeat. Uh, Go on. As our program title is Thinking Tomorrow with Tarur. Sir. I think about tomorrow all the time. Go ahead. Sir, I would like to ask your uh, prediction about the future of our India in its 100 years of is that is 2047 sir i would like to know um, what will be the what will what will happen to our political economical social economic uh, and moral situations of our country also add a note on democratic values on uh, and 100 years of age sir. the answer is very simple it depends on you it depends on you the people of india i can assure you that the one strength we have thanks to our constitution is the ability to determine and change our own destiny. We are the ones who have the future in our hands. We don't have to accept tyranny. We don't have to accept autocracy. We can rise and stand up. Don't forget when the Citizenship Amendment Act was passed. In every city in India, there were powerful protests against it. And not only by the Muslims who were the victims, but by Indians who say that citizenship for us applies to all. We will not let you do this. The only thing that saved the government from the protest was the COVID pandemic, when it was no longer possible to gather in public because of the lockdown. And that ended the protest. But the issue has not gone away. And to this day, the government hasn't had the courage to issue the rules to implement the Citizenship Amendment Act. So you have the right. You can determine. Let me tell you that number of opportunities. In fact, I should have mentioned this when that young lady asked the question. One of the opportunities we have is our demographic dividend. We have a lot of young people. You are part of that generation. You can be the engine for a new, growing, dynamic India. 
and you can decide that you will not accept the reduction of Indian citizenship into one religion or one language or one region. You are the ones who can decide that when economic growth is happening, that you have growth with social justice. You have growth that brings the poor along with you, but you must have growth as well. You are the ones who can determine. Demography, for example, is very interesting. You know what the demographic pattern is? We are now 1.4 billion. Next year, we may overtake China. It was supposed to be happening in 2029, then they said 2026. Now the demographers are saying, well, 2024, we'll overtake China. We'll be the most populous country in the world. We'll keep growing. We'll go up to 1.6, 1.7 billion. We'll be the most populous country in the world. And then what will happen? It will start declining. Because all of you will have fewer children, and your children will have even fewer children. And the prediction is by 2100, we'll be 1.1 billion. So demographers can predict the future. But on economics, society, politics, and democracy, it's in your hands. You must decide your own future and the future of India. Thank you all very much. Jai Namada program in a Avasanan Gurkin in Mumbai, Namada Gurde Kutigalum, Namada faculties of Matra Ola or a photo, Dr. Sashi. I will return into it, sir, please. Uh, before that, uh, Namada Institute, we are very proudly say that it is the name of Panagat Sayyid Hyderli Shaptangal. Namada Tumali Abhimanam, Gandhi Zid, Tumali Ashe, I don't know until the last. That is Jeevita Til Prayogi Kamaki or Neda in the Pairlana. Yangal is Tavan and Todangi at the end of the number eight to Malia Pimanam in the Woody Arikiana. First, Namala Hyderly Shap Tangal de Uru Smaraniga Angeg Presentian. Okay, Dagotan Guruku. Our respected MP will hand over. Okay. Okay, eleven out in the Namala Matra little photo on a decamp on the upper maximum article, then the side on the Marit at the third. Nyan Uri Gari Guri Parate. Number India Ella Chinim Akronamak, Mahatma Gandhi Road and the MG Rodaki. When you have Hyder Ali Shihab Tangal Academy for Civil Services in the Akronam and the Airkim. Shariki Rivati or Nam the Nutan the Pati or Akramana. Hashtags. Hashtags are like you all have hashtags in social media. Samiha Madhi with a little hashtag when order. But Ningal hashtags in the graduates I came out of the bachelor. Nalu Akronamai. Or Adodapum, Sarnadu gift, Kuran de Peribasha, Vivi Shukur, the other, Tangal Summer Pigno. Adodapum, Namade Davut, I could tell just Sarnadu Bustagam Samanikino. Please come. I remember if it was the chair on the water rolling chair, teachers in Erika, faculties in Erika, all staff of Matra. Bakelaver on the Sagar Chadarnam in the Perdigana, you do photo frame in Agatha. Please come. Good to be here. Be Come first. Ah. Come. Come on. Ah, Baba. Very, very. Good to be here. Okay. Okay, okay. Be here. Okay. Now, let's go to Habibu. Uh, uh, uh. Okay. Next photograph. Okay. 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 Okay.